It's Friday, January 11th, Saturday, January 12th, if you're on the East Coast or across the pond. And this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you had a great day and night. I am your host, Dave Scott, broadcasting to you live from the Great White North, on top of the mountains of central British Columbia, right here at SOR headquarters. We welcome you nightly on the SOR Radio Network, Deep Talk Radio, and Revolution Radio. If you want to check out our archives, we have them free for you at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do me a favor hit that subscribe button our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you you can rock out to bumblefoot go shopping at our spaced out radio store read up on captain shirk's sor newswire and much more tonight's show is brought to you by the youtube channel and suho sebastian martin brings high quality messages to the masses so make sure you head to our website click on the Insuho banner and subscribe today John Corner is an adjunct professor of American history at Erie Community College and the founder of Paranormal Walks in Buffalo, New York. The last time John was on, well, let's just say he had one strange story to tell about catching a mysterious virus just days after his book, Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X, hit the stands. And now, tonight, John is back talking about new information that led to the deaths of both JFK and John F. Kennedy Jr., Then at the bottom of hour number three, we have Olaf Phillips coming back from Paranoia Magazine for the SOR Newswire. John Corner, it's been a couple of years since we've had you on Spaced Out Radio. Always a pleasure to have you back. How are you? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you doing tonight? I am absolutely fantastic. Now, John, there may be people who are not familiar with you. How did you get invested in the entire JFK conspiracy? Well, it all kind of started when I did my master's thesis, and it was about the agency's connection to the drug trade in Laos. CIA was in there since the 1950s, and I did my master's thesis on their connection to the drug trade, and I spent some time just kind of figuring out the extent of that, and you might have heard about, you know, the work that was done by the San Jose Mercury News. There was a reporter named Gary Webb, and he did some of the similar research about this in South America. And it might come to the surprise of some people, the same thing was going on in the 1960s in the Southeast Asia. And it turns out with South America, of course, it was you know crack cocaine, but in Southeast Asia, it was opium and heroin. So the extent of the Vietnam War, and as it went into Laos as well, The cover story was, of course, the domino theory, but as it turns out, what was making them a lot of money was the heroin trade and selling all kinds of drugs to American GIs in Vietnam. And of course, then it was spread into the United States drug market. And that was what my master's thesis was on, and that became the basis of my book, Why the Agency Killed JFK and Malcolm X. When you looked into that, were you always somebody who thought there was a conspiracy around the late president's death, or or did you believe there was something a little bit more to it? Well, I kind of felt like with the Watergate conspiracy, it's it's a foul of money. You know, where is the money? And President Kennedy was trying his best throughout his administration to push for peace in Laos and in Vietnam. And if that was ever achieved, which was his plan, he was going to withdraw the the troops by 1965, then that would bring an end to the drug trade. And also, of course, the defense contractors would be out of many different jobs as well. So you have when that comes to a head in 1963, it's pretty clear that he needs to be eliminated. And there's other motives, too. Obviously, the pigs invasion was there, too. That was where they began to split. But if you put this in combination of the fact that the agency wanted to entrench themselves there with the drug trade, top of the fact the Vietnam War was making so much money, he had to go. It's kind of sad that that's part of the reality of what actually happened during that time. I mean, we all think of you know, going back 50 years ago now, that life was much simpler. Yes, the United States was entering an ugly war or what turned out to be an ugly war in Vietnam. And there was 
a lot of tension at that time, but everybody looked at the at the Kennedys as some sort of new hope for the United States at that time. Absolutely. I mean, he was making a number of changes, uh, not just, you know, with his efforts at peace. He was trying to do things like change, you know, civil rights. Uh, he, of course, opposed the larger civil rights bill. He had the first African-American Secret Service agent. He proposed a number of things, um, like many African-American judges were put out for nomination, some of which were confirmed. So he was doing things for his civil rights. He, of course, was pushing things like ending the space race, he wanted to do a joint moon landing with the Russians. So he was trying to change things, and he would do these things if he had a second term, but of course that never happened. What in your mind made JFK so dangerous for groups like the CIA? Well, I think it's a combination of factors, really. I mean, it all really begins with the Bay Pigs invasion, when he decides not to invade Cuba. And the agency wanted to get rid of Castro. And when he decided not to either provide air support or or bomb Cuba, that was a big turning point. And what's never put in textbooks, which even came as as a surprise to me, is after that happened, the president said he wanted to He said he wanted to break the agency into a thousand pieces, and he meant it too. And the agency was quite upset, and what they started to do was kill off the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps, of course, was his pet program for peace throughout the world. And what they did is they made the Peace Corps into like an agency for war by making their agents join the Corps overseas and promote war. If you go go to the Peace Corps website today, you can look at their qualifications if you've ever been in the agency, you can't join the Peace Corps. So even to this very day, there is a tension there between the two agencies because of what happened back in the 1960s. Incredible. Before we get too deep into the whole JFK assassination and the CIA, as we warm things up here, the last time that you were on this show, you had something very strange happen just a few months previous. I recall you saying to me, you go, Dave, I don't know if my voice is going to last because of this incident. Let's go back to when you released that book, because I think our audience really needs to hear this story about what happens when you write against the CIA. Right. And I just want to bring up the idea again we all know the story probably of gary webb i mentioned him he was a reporter for the san jose mercury news and he was found with two gunshots to the head after he wrote about the same thing i wrote about the agency's connection to the drug trade now his reporting was about south america mine of course of course was about southeast asia so again what happened was just when the book had come out i had i had been struck down by this horrible illness. I was in complete perfect health. I don't do any drugs. I don't smoke. I don't drink alcohol, exercise every day. And I had this, this book signing where I met about, you know, maybe 50, 60 people. And the following day I became gravely ill and I lost over the course of the next few days, about 50 to 60 pounds. Um, I, my lungs and, and, and face started to blow up with, with fluid. And the doctors said a number of different things to me. They said, first of all, you nearly should be dead. Second of all, you looks like you've been poisoned somehow. And it seems like whatever you have is some kind of illness that only comes from Southeast Asia. They couldn't pin down what it was. They said, have you been to Southeast Asia? I said, no, I've never even left the country. For, except for Canada many years ago. But so I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. And over the course of that summer, um, I was in the hospital for many months and I, I lost my voice. Uh, I lost much of my muscle tone and I barely survived that one. So that, again, that was again, like you said, back when I did that interview with you. Now, what did the doctors figure it was, this disease from the Middle East or from the Southeast Asia? They, they said it was some kind of flesh-eating disease, that um, it looked like I had been poisoned somehow. It was meant to just 
take all your muscles away and fill you with fluid and just systematically just destroy your body's organs. And it was, and that's what it did. You may have seen um, a couple of things that happened recently with some people that had been poisoned by Putin. Uh, some of the people that he has poisoned over the years, journalists, one man survived recently, was in D.C., got poisoned. And what happened to him was almost like what happened to me. And it was almost like my body was just dying piece by piece. I could feel my muscles just collapsing, my lungs collapsing. It was excruciatingly painful. And I, I don't even know how I survived, but I somehow just fought through it and I, I, I made it through. A lot of people would say, John, why continue on this path if this was a possibility that you were a target by the CIA or some sort of government agency to take you out over writing this book? Now, a lot of people will also say, John, maybe you were a little paranoid and just ate some really bad shellfish or something along those lines. But, uh, the <laughs> right. sever- but, the, but the severity of it is this. You nearly died. You had to fight for your life. And how come it didn't scare you away from challenging these topics that you continue on the path? That's a good question. I I, I feel like almost like it's my obligation to keep writing. Um, it's, it's my vocation. Uh, I don't know what else I would really do with my life if I didn't write and teach. Uh, I, I feel like if someone has to tell the truth, uh, it might as well be me and I'll take my lumps as I go. And uh, the way I look at the way I write my books, I think you, you know, you can see this too. I try to lay them out with, with the facts and I try to look at each particular situation and explain from my perspective why they make sense. So if the truth is on my side, then I think I can keep going forward and saying, well, you can just judge for yourself. And if if you don't feel that I'm telling the truth, you know, then that's, that's from my perspective, the most I can do is just say, Hey, I'm coming from a perspective or trying to tell the truth. I'll just do the best I can. Did you get any warnings from colleagues, family, friends to just back off a little bit? We we need you here a little bit more importantly than you need to write these uh, stories? Yeah, all of my family uh, basically said, please don't write this JFK Jr. book. Uh, they felt that because the, the situation here is so new with JFK Jr., there has never been a book about his assassination that explains like I'm doing who the guilty parties were. So this one is more problematic, more dangerous than the other one. So I, I understood their concerns. I have two children. Um, I, I know there's a risk, but again, I feel like I just, I have to, do these things. It's just what I have to do. I have to write what I know, write what I feel. So yes, they were concerned. I have given um, some lectures about this to have asked people who ask the same question. And I, again, I feel like, yes, it's a concern, but I feel like it's my obligation and my vocation. So what do your colleagues say? Do they say you're ballsy? Do they say you're crazy? Because you work at a at a college as a adjunct professor, that's a pretty important right. position, mm-hmm. and there's got to be a lot of talk between your colleagues on what what you're doing. There is, in fact, they have posted some clippings about my books, you know, in the faculty area. So they're supportive of it. We've talked about it. Um, I've been teaching there for over ten years, so they're always very supportive, and it's a good environment for me to to work and to and to teach. And my publisher certainly has been supportive, too. So I've been very lucky in having um, students and and the faculty that I work with um, that know that my approach is is fact-based. It's academically based. And it's not where I'm just trying to spin different theories based off of, you know, belief and and myth. Uh, The approach is very sober. I mean, each book has the most... 500 end notes. I mean, it's, it's documented, it's end noted. So it's the kind of approach that is, I think, respected. 
when you sat down to look into not only the JFK assassination, but now you're claiming that JFK Jr., who died in a plane crash, was an assassination as well. I mean, let's face it. That has been such a tragic story for the entire Kennedy family for 50 years, and it just keeps on going. Do you think that there was any lessons learned by the Kennedys that are still surviving or anybody in the family or close to it that basically said, you know what, back off. We're not doing the political thing as hard as we used to, and we're not going to be running for president. Were you able ever to discover anything along those lines so that way the tragedy of the family could could cease? It does seem like this new generation is kind of shying away from politics. But there was an interesting story that I found that was not reported enough that was kind of, I think, shocking to me a little bit that we obviously know that Robert Kennedy's assassin, Sirhan Sirhan, is in a California jail. And he recently came out and revealed that he was, of course, brainwashed by the CIA back in the 1960s to kill Robert Kennedy. So he revealed this to his attorney, William Pepper. He was part of their brainwashing assassin program. And that came out the same year that Nina Rhodes Hughes revealed that she saw, you know, the second gunman at the Bastard Hotel. But what surprised me was that last year, Robert Kennedy Jr. visited Sirhan Sirhan at that California jail and he, he has come to the conclusion now, based on the evidence, the agency killed his father. And this, I think, is a, a interesting sign that the family finally is willing to admit who was behind the killings of all these members of their family. And I think that's a key breakthrough that we need to recognize there, the RFK Jr. visiting Sirhan Sirhan. Why do you think that didn't get enough press? I know, it, it, because I think the mainstream media doesn't like talking about that because their version of events is that it's only, you know, the lone unassassin that ever does any of these, you know, these assassinations. It's just Oswald. It's just Sirhan Sirhan. There's no conspiracies. You know, it's just an accident for JFK Jr. And not questioning, you know, what really happened with, with these events. No, and I understand that, and I can appreciate that. But, you know, last year there was a lot of JFK files that were released to the public. The CIA and other government agencies had some held back that Donald Trump said that he would give them six months. He ended up not releasing them because they said they needed more time to go over the files. I mean, you've had 50 years. What do you need another six months for? It's kind of ridiculous right. and incredulous to the American public who wants to know what's going on. And it all comes down to what is there to hide? What are on those sheets of paper that are, have the big top secret confidential stamps on them that leads us to believe that there is nothing to be hidden? Because if there isn't, but outside of names of, say, oh, special agents, then right. there should be no problem in releasing them whether it's for Correct. that or Sirhan Sirhan's killing of RFK. Absolutely. I'll give you an example of that. Um, kind of ties into my book a little bit. Um, you have the director of the, the CIA in the 1970s was, of course, George H.W. Bush. And the House Assassinations Committee asked him for many files that regarded the assassination, and he redacted most of them. So what ends up happening here is when we get to this, you know, current situation with President Trump, when we, we look at the files that were about to be released, many were redacted by George H.W. Bush when he was director of the agency. So we have that going back to the 70s. And one name that gets redacted enormously is this name Orlando Bosch, we can mention here, too that connects directly to George H.W. Bush. So the, George H.W. Bush, he, he was one of the only people in the world that did not know where he was on November 22nd, 1963. Now, isn't that a little strange? <laughs> I mean, just think Obviously. of that for a second. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, that was a seminal event for their generation. So he has no memory of where he was for some reason. So, so you would think that he, if you're hiding something, that would be the reason why he's saying that. There is evidence that he was in Dealey Plaza. Jim Garrison, in fact, found evidence he was arrested in Dealey Plaza outside the Dale Tex building, taken to Dallas Police Headquarters in question. So he was there, but he lied about it. And I'm bringing up this guy named Orlando Bosch because Orlando Bosch in the 1970s was protected by Bush several times from extradition. Bosch was an assassin for the agency, did a number of unusual things that were kind of, you know, in the gray area of what you should be doing for assassin work in South America primarily. But Bush, every single time, protected him, kept him away from prosecution. And this is one name that keeps getting redacted in, in the files just released by President Trump, Orlando Bosch. And just, oh, by the way, Orlando Bosch was in Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963. He was this man that we call um, dark complected man. He was on Elm Street. So all this crazy stuff, it goes back to what you were saying about these files that connect to, you know, George H.W. Bush. Do you believe, as we got about a minute here, just over before we go to break, do you believe that George Bush had something to do with the assassination? Well, it seems like uh, J.K. Jr. certainly thought he did. And we can, after the break, we can talk a bit about why that is. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. You know, uh, we, what we should do right now is tell everybody that you can get John Corner's two books, Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X, The Secret Drug Trade in Laos, as well as his newest book, Exploding the Truth, The JFK Jr. Assassination. Both books are on Amazon. They're about 12 bucks a piece, so I highly suggest you go over to Amazon and and pick those up. They are good reads, especially if you're a fan of JFK, if you're a fan of conspiracies, and if you weren't sure if the JFK Jr. assassination was an assassination or just a, a plane crash that happened, well, John here is going to give you a ton of information on that. John Corner is our guest tonight. We have him for another two hours on Spaced Out Radio. We're going to get into the JFK assassination right after this on the Mighty SOR. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there. This is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Uger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box, the iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. 
Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Hi there, this is Geraldine Orozco from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Did you know Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi there, this is Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm here to take you on a paranormal journey each Saturday and Sunday night. Why change the station when you have it all right here? Together, we'll hang out and share some strange and scary stories. And don't forget, we have Psychic Sundays as well, so come tune in Spaced Out Weekend. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com, where we own the night. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. 
from commercial spots to banners. We have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, talking JFK assassination tonight with our guest, John Corner. You can go to Amazon, pick up his books, Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X, The Secret Drug Trade in Laos, and his newest book, The JFK Jr. Assassination. We're going to get into that one in the top of the hour. John, welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. Good to have you here. Thanks, Dave. Now, In the last half hour, we slightly touched on the fact of John F. Kennedy Jr. obviously getting murdered in Dealey Plaza, and the official story is Lee Harvey Oswald shot and killed him for whatever the reason was, politically or non-politically, or he was just upset at the world. Who knows? There are also people who believe he was some sort of CIA assassin or the other part is maybe he was just a patsy. We really don't know. Take us back to Dealey Plaza back then. Well, I think if you start with Oswald, the best evidence that we have is that he was in the lunchroom at the time of the assassination. When you have the first person that sees him, the detective that comes in from Dallas Police sees him in the lunchroom. He's not in any way upset. He's not out of breath. So there's no way he could have run down all those stairs and shot all those shots and been not completely calm and, 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 you know, not in any way upset. So he probably wasn't even one of the assassins. He did work for the agency. We do know that one of his, uh, the girl that he was dating, his mistress, uh, worked with the agency too. He was probably part of a conspiracy, a plot to kill Castro. And that was what he was working on at the time to go into Mexico city, to get into Cuba, to start a program to kill Fidel Castro. That was probably what his, uh, his role was, and he made it for a convenient scapegoat, as you were saying, for being the president's uh, assassin to cover up who the real killers were. And that's probably what we think he was, according to the research of many people who looked into his background. So many people died along this trail, whether they were said to be involved, whether they were reporters like Dorothy Kilgallen and many mm-hmm. others who, who just seemed to mysteriously disappear or die. There was a big cover-up on this, wasn't there, John? Oh, yeah. We can just mention maybe two off the bat here. We can maybe even mention Lee Bowers, who was behind the grassy knoll looking at the area where the you know probably the headshot came from. He saw two people shooting. He, did, he died in a mysterious car crash about a year after the assassination. We could mention Mary Cord Meyer, who was one of President Kennedy's mistresses. She died about a year after the assassination, too. And kind of an ironic thing we can mention with that, he began his affair with her on July 16th, 1962, which was the same day of the plane crash for JFK Jr., July 16th, 1999. So we can mention two of them, and we can even connect the RFK assassination with Nina Rhodes Hughes. She saw a second gunman at the Ambassador Hotel Ballroom And she lives in British Columbia now, and she kept quiet for all these years because she saw just what we're talking about, people disappearing or dying to talk about the JFK assassination. So she kept quiet all these years. Do you feel that the truth is still out there and and that it will eventually come out what truly happened on that day? Or do you think now that we are, you know, 50 going on 60 years since this tragic event, that people are getting a little bit uh, mundane about the whole thing? It's possible that they are, yeah. I mean, but there have been a number of things that have come out recently that I think are encouraging. Uh, We can talk about perhaps the Howard Hunt on his deathbed. He revealed um, what he felt were the key figures in the assassination from the agency that helped plan it, including Cord Meyer and David David Atlee Phillips, David Morales, who, of course, worked in in the drug trade in Southeast Asia. Both of them did. And you have, he felt there was also a connection to right up to Lyndon Johnson, he said. So 
that came out several years ago, just before he died. That was documented by his son, St. John. So we can talk about, you know, that we can talk about the fact that this Bruder film has been analyzed as being a complete fabrication from recent work done by a number of excellent researchers. So they can, there can be times when you can see truth breaking through. If you just look at the evidence there, it's, it's out there. A lot of people point the finger at Lyndon Johnson, that he was the man who helped spearhead this decision to take out JFK. And some people go to the famous photo inside Air Force One when he's being sworn in. And the Texas governor at the time, I believe, was kind of winking at him. Right. With yeah. a smile on his face. How many yeah. players do you think were in on this decision? And how did it not leak to the president of the United States, John F. Kennedy? Well, I think that at the time we get to 1963, there are a number of things happening within the inner circle where they're feeding information to Johnson directly uh, and away from President Kennedy. And he is out of the loop on, on a number of different things. He only really trusts McNamara and his brother, Robert Kennedy. And the other parts of his administration are conspiring against him. And the agency, the vice presidents, we can talk about Operation Northwoods, for example, where the agency and the military had planned to pull up a passenger jet to kill Americans and blame all this on Castro to start a war against Cuba. He shuts that down March of 63 and makes him quite upset that he canceled that program. Then he also decides to withdraw from Vietnam in October of 63. So he's doing things to isolate himself. And polling at the time shows he will trout Sperry Goldwater. So there's going to be a second term of JFK. So it's getting quite about the time when we get to 1963 in November that things are getting quite um, to a boiling point, I guess you could say. And the night before the assassination, there is this what you might call planning meeting at the home of Clinton Merkinson this oil magnate in, in, you know, North Dallas at the meeting is Lyndon Johnson and Nixon's there. Hoover's there. George H.W. Bush is there. And they're all planning the, we think the assassination because when they, he, when Johnson leaves the meeting, he tells his mistress, those damn Kennedys are not going to embarrass me anymore. And it's pretty clear that he knows that the assassination is, is a go. But he tells that to his mistress, that they're not going to embarrass him anymore. How can Lyndon Johnson have a mistress? He's not an attractive guy. <laughs> right, yeah. That just blows. That's, that's the first the time I've heard yeah. that, John. He is not an attractive guy. Like, I'm, right, a, so, I'm a solid 5.3 <laughs> out of 10, and he's well below me. Well below right. me. Well there, well, there is the great documentary called The Men Who Killed Kennedy. And it talks about this in some in some detail. There is a book called Texas in the Morning that's written by his mistress. And she talks about his affair, affair with him. He, she even had a son with him. And this is one of the people that kind of shows Johnson's role in this. And you think about the motive here, why these oil men would want to kill Kennedy, be a part of this, maybe even fund the assassination. JFK was going to end with something called, getting into the weeds a little bit here, but the oil depletion allowance. So the oil depletion allowance was going to cut off their profits that they were making lots of money off of in the 1960s. That was going to all come to an end. And Johnson, an oil man, and texting with oil from his early days in Texas, being funded by them, it all kind of fits in with that. So that's kind of where this all comes from. I understand that. And why Dallas, though? Was it because they had control of the of the parade ground? We do know that the, the, the parade had shifted from its original route. Maybe go into that a little bit. Yeah, all the, the, all the different things that would have been needed to protect the president were not done. Secret Service was completely derelict in their duties during the entire assassination. And in fact... Two different times they were called back from being on Kennedy's rear bumper. So you can see 
when they land in, in Love Field, they're they're called back, and even before the assassination, they're called back during the shooting. The only agent to react was Clint Hill, just him. The night before, even they were drinking, and many of them went into that morning completely hungover. So. We even know for a fact that during the headshot, Agent Greer hit the brakes to make an easier shot for the assassin. And that was taken out of this Bruder film. So they did a number of different things here that could point to their complicity here in the assassination, including when it was all over. They took this Bruder film and gave it to the agency, and they changed and altered it at their Hawkeye plant in Rochester, New York in a number of different ways to cover up what really happened there on Elm Street. Do you think that the Zapruder film shows the entire incident, or do you think that there are major pieces missing? There have been a number of different things about it that were changed. One thing is the car came to a complete stop during the headshot. And that was taken out. You actually can see the two agents in the front going violently forward. And it doesn't make any sense because the car keeps going. So the bodies rush forward. And also Greer's head turns around quickly in a very unusual way that can't be done in any, in any normal kind of a way. So they, t- they took out the, the stopping of the car. Also the president's head was changed too. You can see that the president's front of his head explodes, not the rear, indicating a, a shot coming from behind. But every doctor at Parkland Hospital, every single one said the president's wound was the back of his head, not the front. So they changed that too. So the headshot was changed, the stopping of the car was changed. They also took out another stop on the corner of, Hel- of Elm and Houston. So they wanted to make this look like something that it was not. And only when it was changed was it released to the public. And now we have what's left, which is not even accurate. Is there a proper film out there? Well, what happened was the real film that shows what really happened was taken to, first of all, the agency had their own headquarters in Washington where they did photographic work. Dina Brigliozzi took the film, made some copies of it for the director. And he, he did an interview recently about this. He said he noticed the president's head exploded. The car came to a stop. The wound was in the back of his head. All these different things you would expect based on the witnesses that saw what happened. But he, then the film was given to the agency at the Hawkeye plan in Rochester, New York, to make all these changes. And then who knows what happened to the real film? It might be at Time Life. It might be in the family of Abraham Zabruder. We don't really know who has it. But what's been released to the public is not what was actually what took place on Elm Street. It was actually quite different. Are you talking about the Nick's film? No, Nick's film is from the opposite side. So that one is from a different angle from okay. the opposite side of, of Elm. Um, the Zabruder film is from the side where the depository would be. And he was on a pedestal. And that film had a number of different changes. And one more thing that was mentioned by Bruby Ozzy too, he could see a shot that was hitting the Stemmons Freeway sign too. That was also taken out. So, all these different things were changed to make it look like what they wanted the version of, event, of events to be a shot from behind by Oswald. So it's almost like no matter what Kennedy was not leaving Dallas alive. No, they had to make sure if this is a public execution. And if you look at, you know, who was involved here again, going back to what E. Howard Hunt had said, they had to make sure that this was planned very much to the nth degree, make sure the assassins were paid in heroin, ironically enough, and they were French assassins that the, that they hired for the job and they got the job done. There probably was a team on the grassy knoll. There was one in the Dale Tex building 
and one in the depository. Not in the, not in the far end of the window, the closer window. The far end uh, where Oswald was supposed to shoot is through a tree. That doesn't make any sense. The one that they probably shot from, Hunt said, was the one closer to, to the other side of the, of the building, the farther side. So anyway, you know, that's probably what happened here, according to the evidence to the forensics of the case. So what do you think Leo Harvey Oswald's job was that day? Did he know he was going to be a patsy? Well, I think he started to understand that once he got arrested. One strange thing about this is the time of Tippett's uh, murder is approximately 1.03 p.m. And he is accused of killing Dallas Police Officer J.D. Tippett. But according to those at the theater where he was, you know, arrested, he arrived at the theater at that same time. So how could he kill J.D. Tippett but be at the Texas theater where he got arrested? So it doesn't make any sense why they even arrested this guy other than the fact, like he said, that he was supposed to be a patsy for the assassination. So he gets to Dallas Peace headquarters and doesn't know even why he's really there. He didn't shoot Tippett. He didn't shoot the presidents. But there he is question and he keeps saying that he's not the man who did this he denies the charges at the press conference at night asked for a lawyer and it just seems it just for him to be pinned by this even from his own perspective he probably wonders you know why him because he went to russia for some time because he was an agent and then the following you know, Sunday on live television, he's taken out by you know, Jack Ruby, and no that, trial was ever given. Yeah, that that just seemed a little bit too suspicious. I mean, I realize we're looking back at it with, you know, 2020 hindsight, but back then the emotion of it all and, you know, Kennedy being the people's president, you could see, you know, Jack Ruby just feeling that pain that all of America was feeling that we wanted this guy's head and his heart. Right. And Jack Ruby took care of it on live television. Right. So, I mean, you have with, with Jack Ruby, I mean, that's even another story there, too. Oswald and Ruby, of course, knew each other. Uh, they had been seen several times at his nightclub. So it seems like Ruby would have been a man to silence Oswald because we talked about Oswald did know a lot of different things. He was in the agency. Uh, he was probably trained in Russian intelligence because he was trained in the Russian language. He served some time in Japan. So there are things about him that are unusual. We said, we did mention that his mistress said that he worked with her for this program to, to kill Castro. So there are things about him that didn't need to be revealed. And that was neatly taken care of with, with Ruby, known as an assassin. One person did it. Close the book on JFK. Ruby also had cancer shortly after that, an aggressive form of cancer. Do you think he was injected with it to make it happen, or do you think he already had the cancer in him? Well, at the point where he gets cancer... It's just before he starts talking about wanting to, you know, reveal what he knew about all this. And then at that point, he, you know, he no longer is alive. So I don't know the answer to that, but there is unusual timing there, I guess you could say. That's all I can really say about that. I'm not really sure because it could be just a coincidence, but maybe not. There's a lot of coincidences with this. <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure. Everything is is a coincidence, you know. I mean, even looking at that photograph where the Texas president allegedly is blinking, or uh, sorry, uh, governor there. I mean, was that just the photo catching something at the wrong time and freeze framing it? We don't know. You know, I mean, if you look at the video, the video that came out sure looks like he's winking, <laughs> you know, yeah. but... But as people start to die off now, and they've been dying off for a few years, we're now 50 years past this event, there's not a lot of people still alive that would have been heavily involved in this case. Right. Do you think that there is a significant importance for the CIA to continue to cover up this murder slash assassination? Well, I think that if we keep looking at what really happened here, 
And we can conclude that our own government did this to its elected president. Then why can it not happen again? So I think you have to understand the implications of this. I mean, just you, I mean, just anyone really that, I mean, if, if, if we can conclude based on evidence and facts that we and other people have, then the agency itself is not legitimate. It's a rogue government. And they could do this to other people if they wanted to and get away with it. So I think that's the implications of this. That's the scary part about this. There's a rumor out there, and I don't know how true it is, that the CIA just doesn't kill anybody anymore after, especially American citizens, after this incident with about 40 seconds left before we have to go to break here. Do you believe that statement or do you think it's just a rumor? So the question would be after JFK assassination, they stopped doing this to anybody else. That's the idea. Well, we can, without question, understand completely that they did this to his brother. Because Sirhan Sirhan admitted this. He talked about this, and we said that RFK's son even understands this now, that the agency killed Robert Kennedy. And the day that JFK died, RFK went to the agency's director, and he told him, I know you did this, and I'm going to prove it. And for the next five years, he tried to do just that. So one of the reasons he ran for president in 68 was to open up the investigation due to the assassination and, and the agency. Right. He was gonna, right. So that was part of his plan. Yeah. John, you hold on. We're going to go to break at top of the hour here. John Corner is our guest tonight talking JFK assassination. Next hour, we're getting into JFK Jr. Was he assassinated as well? Stay tuned on Spaced Out Radio. Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. 
The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. EscapeWatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? 
You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. This weekend, while I am out finding my zen and my chi and maybe some Sasquatch, Tessa Nicole Thomas will be back with Spaced Out Weekend. She gets going at 9 o'clock Pacific, midnight Eastern, Saturday and Sunday at spacedoutradio.com. Hi to everyone listening in on the SOR Radio Network, Deep Talk Radio, and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out our archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do Old Navy the favor, hit that subscribe button. Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Calipesian. Calipesian is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, pick up some really cool swag, and you can read up on SOR Newswire, put together by Captain Shirk, and so much more. Tonight we are talking with author John Corner. He has a couple of amazing books out. They can be bought on Amazon as we speak. The first one, called... Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X, The Secret Drug Trade in Laos, and his second book, which we're going to get into this hour, The JFK Jr. Assassination. John, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Dave. John, John, there's a lot of people who will scratch their heads saying JFK Jr. was assassinated. I thought he died in a plane crash back in the early 90s. What Mm -hmm. happened? Take us back to that day. Well, yeah, this is uh, July 16th, 1999. And boy, at that point in time, that weekend, 30 years earlier, was a Chappaquiddick. And horrible tragedy for the Kennedy family that, that weekend, too. So what was planned that weekend was Rory Kennedy was going to get married that weekend at Hannesport. So JFK Jr. was picking up his wife and sister-in-law, Lauren Bissett. They took off from New Jersey Caulfield Airstrip and were heading to Hyannisport to go to the wedding. It was Friday night, and he was going to drop off his sister-in-law at Hyannisport, sorry, at Martha's Vineyard, then head up to Hyannisport with his wife. That was the plan. But at 9.40 p.m., the plane crashed into the Vineyard Sound. And what we might know about this, just some basic things people have said. Well, maybe his foot was hurting him because he broke his leg two months before. Maybe that's why he crashed the airplane. Maybe the weather was bad. Maybe he was a bad pilot. Maybe he was disoriented by the weather conditions. And all those things are not true. So I wanted to use this book to kind of dispel all these notions and we can get into this in this hour, that if you look at what really happened here, it was not an accident. Why do you say that? Why do you say, I, I realize you just kind of said a little bit of a roundup, but do you? why do you believe mm-hmm. that taking out JFK Jr. was part of the entire plan? Okay, let's, you know, let's look at the evidence then. So the official version of events by the NTSB is he crashed the plane from spatial disorientation. So that means he was disoriented. He couldn't know what was up, what was down, what was left, what was right. That's why the plane crashed. So at 9.39 p.m., one hour into the flight, he calls into air traffic control at Martha's Vineyard and says he's about to land the airplane. So if he was in any way disoriented, he would have said so right then. The plane crashed one minute later. It was dropping 14,000 feet per second within one minute. So that's one point to make right there. He would, if he was in distress, he would have said so. Secondly, the FAA studied the weather that night. Edward Meyer from the FAA was hired to do this, and he concluded that the weather was fine. In fact, people in the vineyard were fishing, having a nice evening, walking in the summer air. It was a great evening. There was nothing that could have caused spatial disorientation. So we know those two facts right there. Third, JFK Jr. was not a reckless pilot. All of his flight instructors, 
concluded. Harold um, Anderson, Ralph Howard, all these different people that knew him. He was meticulous. For example, uh, he flew the same flight 17 times without a flight instructor and five times at night. So he knew what he was doing. So we can conclude that this flight was not disoriented. He was fine. And we also know that three people saw an explosion in the air at the time of this so-called accident. And we can also mention that there was a 17 nautical mile radius of a debris field where they were finding on the land luggage, sneakers, all kinds of things that indicated that there was an explosion. Do you believe that he was shot down or there was a bomb planted on the plane? I think either one of those is possible because if you look at the testimony of people that saw this, they saw a flash in the sky and and an explosion. Now, Jim Maher has studied this. The late Jim Maher has also studied this. And he studied many commercial aircraft explosions and crashes. And he concluded the same thing I'm concluding, that if it was just an accident, there would be a very small area to recover the plane and the bodies in one one place. They would be crunched together in one area. But because there was a 17 nautical mile radius of debris, that meant that there was a breaching of the cabin, which indicated an explosion from, like you said, a missile or a bomb on the plane. And we know, as I was saying, from the witnesses and from the fact that he called in at 9.39 p.m., that there was this explosion. Here's one more thing to think about, too. One more key fact here. We know exactly where the plane drops off of radar at 9.40 p.m. We know exactly the spot. It's just off Martha's Vineyard. He called in to see where to tell them where he was. The water there is just 100 feet deep. But it took the Navy and the Coast Guard five days to recover the bodies. That makes completely no sense. They knew where he left off of radar. It's a very small area. The water is very shallow. So the very fact they took five days to recover the bodies and, re- and make it look like an accident it shows us more about what's happening here. Five days. Could they not find the bodies or were they scattered because of the explosion and ripped apart? So they were just trying to get as much of the bodies possible because Martha's Vineyard also has a very large concentration of great white sharks in that area, too. Good point, too. So the bodies may have been taken by pieces, may have been taken by these sharks over different parts of the area. So when the plane blew up, when body parts were scattered everywhere, plane pieces, luggage, it took them five days to recover everything. If it was just an accident where they know where the plane went down in one spot, then you would think it would take just a matter of hours. And in fact, we could prove this, that it did. And make my more point about this. So this is such a key thing. I think it proves conspiracy here. Just this one key thing. So at 2.15 a.m., on July 17th, the following day, 2.15 a.m., ABC News and Peter Jennings, they report that the Coast Guard and the Navy have, have heard the Pepper Saratoga's rescue beacon. They picked it up and they're closing in on it. So the 2.15 a.m., the following day. So this makes sense. As I said, they knew where the plane dropped off of radar, it's just one plane. It's three bodies. It's not that big of a deal. It take about maybe five hours or six hours. But then the Navy says something that just is amazing. They, they say, no, it's not Piper of Saratoga. It is a downed naval aircraft that has crashed. It's not JFK's plane, JFK Jr.'s plane. It's a downed naval military aircraft. And then because it's not JFK's plane, ABC News drops a story, and it just goes away. So think about this for a second. If that was a downed naval military aircraft, where, 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 where is the pilot? Did he die in the crash? What mission was he on? Did he collide with JFK's plane? Where is the plane? Where is the wreckage? 
but because they don't ask these questions, we don't know the answers. Mm-hmm. Which makes sense. And we'll never know the answers because they're locked and sealed somewhere that they don't need to be. Right. So, so the, this cover story was given. Isn't it? So if, if it really was a naval aircraft that's in the water there, that's hard to cover that up. Where is the pilot's body? Was the family notified? Where's the wreckage for that aircraft? Could have been so it, it seems like that, that's not what happened there. Also, we can mention that the rescue beacon for the Saratoga is a high-pitched stroll sound. It just kind of goes mm, like that. The rescue beacon for a naval aircraft is like a foghorn, much different. You can't confuse them. So there's no way there was a naval aircraft there in the water. It's a complete fabrication. Because, again, you'd have to know where the pilot was, know about the family, where the aircraft wreckage was. None of that was ever recovered. So instead, that was a cover story that they put out, that the Navy put out. And also, we find out that at this point in time, guess who does recovery efforts? Just take a wild guess. The CIA. They come in there, too. So we have those two agencies. They come in and sue off the area. No media. No family comes in for five days. So this cover story comes out that was one of their aircraft, but no, it was actually the the Saratoga, and they needed time to make it look like an accident. Just at that moment in time, they they put the lie out, 2.15 a.m. on the 17th. Do you think the CIA was afraid that JFK Jr. was starting to gain political clout within the Democratic Party? Absolutely. He was, uh, at this point in time, selling his magazine. He was positioning himself to run for the White House, for governor of New York. He ruled out the Senate, by the way. We can mention that, too. He talked about this with his family in the late part of it, of 90 into 1999, that the Senate race was not for him. Uh, He wanted to be more of like a leader, a governor, a president. That was more of his path. So, he also didn't want to go up against the Clintons. The two families were very close. They still are. So that was not for him. So that was his path, governor of New York, then the presidency. Hmm. Why was the CIA afraid? Do you think that they were worried that he was going to expose them and finish dad's job? Well, let's look back a little bit in his life. He, from the early part of his life in the 1970s, for example, when he's in high school, he starts to question the official version of events like we did last hour. So he has uh, a girlfriend at that point in time named Meg Azioni. And Meg Azioni writes a book about her friendship with JFK Jr. And she documents in that book how he questioned the assassination when he's in the, you know, the late part of his high school years. And in the 1980s and beyond, he still does the same sorts of things as his own investigations and comes to the conclusion that we have the, the same thing we've concluded, that the Warren Commission was fabricated and it wasn't the truth. So he starts to do a number of things, hires investigators on his own. And it seems like once he gets to the late part of his life, he wants to expose the truth and run for office, two things that put him against the Bush family. So do you think the Bushes had anything to do with this? Well, there is motive here, certainly. And we go back to, again, the the 1960s, and the Bush family certainly was in the agency. Uh, George H.W. Bush was part of the agency. He was director of the agency. He was in Dealey Plaza. He helped plan the Bay of Pigs invasion. So there are a number of things that connect him to we mentioned Orlando Bosch and the inner circle of JFK Jr. mentions a number of different times that he names a magazine George as indication of his suspicion where the real assassination blame should be lying with George H.W. Bush. That seems like a far stretch. Why would you name it after a person who you think? killed your dad. I think it's kind of like a sarcastic uh, sign that he's 
you know, he is positioning himself to expose the truth about what really happened here. There was a really unusual thing that, that took place at the funeral of um, Gerald Ford. Very strange. George H.W. Bush gets up at the eulogy and he starts talking about the Warren Commission and how Gerald Ford was in the Warren Commission, how there is all the conspiracy nuts out there and the Warren Commission was the truth. And when he talks about the assassination of JFK, he starts to smile and laugh. It's bizarre and, 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 and strange. He does that. So there is this unusual thing about JFK Jr. and the Bush family that, that kind of mixes into this whole conspiracy theory here. And again, it, if you look at what's going on here in his life at this point in time, he's becoming more of a threat because he wants to run for office. He wants to become president and go up against George W. Bush for the presidency. Do you think that whether win or lose, he would have been a huge player in the exposure of what happened? Because I think if I was in that position, in his shoes, knowing that I could light up the entire nation of the United States by saying, why don't you tell us what really happened to my dad? That would right. that would have pretty much launched him into the presidency for eight years. Right. I think it would have, yeah. And I, I think, again, if we look at the Kennedy family, going back to Robert Kennedy, there was that in his uncle, that desire for the truth, that he ran for president in 1968 with the expectation that once he became president, he would end the agency. He'd expose the truth, hold trials for treason, hold new investigation, and bring them to account. Because he concluded, like we did too, that they killed his brother. And he was going to make that a part of why he would become president. And the Vietnam War, what his brother was going to try to do too. So, our Kennedy Jr., we talked about him too. He knows the truth now as well. So, the Kennedy family, I think, has this, and it's in JFK Jr., this desire to carry in the legacy of, of his uncles. And I think he felt obligated to do this. I mentioned before, this is back in his teenage years, he was thinking about this. It was ingrained in him. And I feel, I feel like I'm, once we get to the late 1990s, it's becoming more important to him. Because the timing is interesting, because if he becomes um, president, we'll go to the timeline here, he would run for president maybe in 2004, for example. He'd be uh, 42 years old the same age as his father was in 1963. So the timing there I think is important because he wants to get this going before he gets too much into his 40s and 50s. It's got to happen now. Did he feel the pressure to run or was this something that he wanted to do? I think he he felt almost an obligation to do this, a a call to service that was in his family. Uh, At this point in, in his life, George Magazine was had served its, its purpose. He hired, he hired an investigator named Wayne Madsen to look into the assassination. He was going to use that in the last kind of part of the magazine's existence to look into the, the assassination through this investigator and then kind of close up the magazine after that happened and then run for office. And that was kind of his plans in his life at that point in time, run for office, expose the truth, and just get going with the rest of his life. And that was where he was at in July of 1999. So when you look at it, obviously he had motive. Was the CIA scared? Do you or Have you talked to anybody at the CIA that said, we needed to do something about this? Were you ever tipped off with any of your sources? Well, what's interesting that happened to me with this, okay, ever since this book has come out, I have had people contact me that have confirmed what I've said. And even a witness came forward that was at Martha's Vineyard. Now, she has said that people at the vineyard know what happened. And it's, it's, they don't talk about it, though. They were there that night. A lot of people were on the, walking around. They saw the explosion, but they don't talk about it. And uh, I counter this, too, because one of the witnesses was a reporter for the Vineyard Gazette. And it took a hard and long time to find this person's name through microfilm because I requested microfilm 
two different times and was denied every single time to get the microfilm. I only got it from Library of Congress to get the person's name that saw the explosion. So there's a resistance here for the truth. It, 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 and it, it's, it's upsetting in some ways because it, it's, it's there. It just has to be uncovered. Why do you think journalists covered up this fact? Do you think they didn't read into it as much as they should have? Yeah, I mean, there was this quick, judge, quick rush to judgment here. I mean, right away there is this idea he was a reckless pilot, that he caused this, his, this explosion, you know, because of what he did. And every single person that worked with him said just the opposite. Give you an example. On April 22nd, 1998, he had a key test to pass an instrument test. And they gave him conditions of disorientation, where it would be like a, you know, a, a rainstorm, a blizzard, or whatever. And he put a hood on and passed the test. The same conditions that were allegedly uh, that night of the, of the accident. He passed the test with a hood on. So he knew what he was doing. He knew autopilot. He was a great pilot. And he also had... At this point in his life, as I mentioned before, 17 times of, of flying that same flight five times at night with no flight instructor. So the mainstream media puts out this myth, you know, that he was a bad pilot, that his leg was hurting him, that he crashed the aircraft, you know. None of this was true. He called in one hour into the flight. Everything was fine. He was going to land the aircraft. And one minute later, there was this explosion. Mm-hmm. And he was known as a very safe pilot. The, the, I remember the media coming out with that, talking about his flight safety record. He was very meticulous about his plane. And right. for this to happen, this is someone who would know if his wings are, were ailerons or something had been tampered with. Right. So the, the plane itself was fine. So he inspected the plane. So you got to wonder, right, if there's a surface to air missile that's used, that's possible. If they hide a, if some kind of bomb on the plane. We could mention, too, that his, the place where he stores the aircraft, there is no police there. And there's no security at this aircraft, this, this facility. So anyone could go in there, in and out, could look at the plane, inspect it if they want to, in times of off hours. So it's a strange place to put your plane. It's called Phil Airstrip. We can also mention that the, of the year after this, in year 2000, the men who end up crashing their planes into the Twin Towers, they train at, their, at that aircraft, that facility. They're the ones that they use that place to train. Interesting. So Interesting. John, I'm going to get you to hold on right there, okay? Hold that thought. We're great. going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Author John Corner is our guest tonight. Was JFK Jr. assassinated? We're going to learn more in the next half hour. Stay tuned on Spaced Out Radio. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Did you know Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi there, this is Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm here to take you on a paranormal journey each Saturday and Sunday night. Why change the station when you have it all right here? Together, we'll hang out and share some strange and scary stories. And don't forget, we have Psychic Sundays as well, so come tune in Spaced Out Weekend. 
We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com, where we own the night. Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and stores that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. 
It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there. This is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything is an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. We've passed the midway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. So glad to have you with us wherever you may be. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters here up in the great white north. Now, tonight we are talking JFK assassination. Was JFK Jr. assassinated? That's what our guest, author John Corner, believes as we continue this conversation Right now, John, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's been a pleasure. John, you know, I could understand why there was an obligation that JFK Jr. felt he needed to run for the presidency. He wanted to solve this mystery. He wanted that power to go into the files, whether he made it public or not, just to see what really happened to dad. And I could see where that's a little bit personal. But, I mean, this is a guy who had everything. He had money. He had looks. He had women. He could do absolutely anything that he wanted. And he didn't have to worry about it. He was a major, major trust fund kid who cut his own teeth by being a lawyer, starting George Mm -hmm. Magazine, being an entrepreneur. Why take the chance? Why not just be like his sister Carolyn and live comfortably? I think after his mother died, uh, it kind of him kind of sober up and realized that he needed to kind of grow up and maybe put all the the girls behind and get a serious relationship with with Lauren, with Carolyn Bissett rather, and uh, settle down and do more of a a serious life, a call to service like his father did. And the timing I think is interesting because if he did run for governor in 2002 and then remember president in 2004 again the same timeline that his father would be in early 1960s 42 years old and i think that was appealing to him you know it would kind of be the thing that he would want to do with his life and would coincide with ending up the magazine doing the investigations and the assassination what you think about since the 1970s i mean it's all kind of coming to a head there in the late 1990s and I think what is appealing about him, uh, what would have made him win these elections, is he was apolitical. He was a kind of a person that rose above politics that both parties would like. Republicans and Democrats really beloved him. They liked him. He was charismatic. And ironically enough, if he did run for governor of New York in 2002, there was, of course, the terrorist attacks in September 2001, he was a New Yorker. He would have been there and would have been able to kind of guide the nation through and heal the nation during that, that subsequent decade, becoming president, governor, and that very key time when those attacks took place in New York City. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Do you believe then that if he had run, that the old skull and bones led by George Bush Sr., who recently passed away, would have stopped him. Do you think there was a message in the CIA that says, if JFK Jr. starts to make a move politically, we end it now? Yeah, I think that's why this happens. I mean, the timing here is important because this happens July 16th. So, this time period, in the middle of July, the Skull and Bones meets at Bohemian Grove every single year in Palo Alto, California. And that, that is their time to plan their different little things like, you know, maybe 
world, new world order kind of things. And President Bush selected Dick Cheney on July 16th, the following year at Bohemian Grove. And George H. George W. Bush disappeared for three days during the JFK Jr. accident at Bohemian Grove. So July 16th, it's a strange day. It's also the day we talked about 30 years before that weekend was Chappaquiddick. July 16th was when JFK started an affair with Mary Court Meyer. It's an unusual day that the agency seems to be focusing on here, like you said, skull and bones, to make sure this man did not become president of the United States. Trump has a question in the chat room for you. He goes, Mr. Corner, what's your thoughts on this? He says two witnesses told the team that they saw George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush at the Essex County, New Jersey airport with Israeli Mossad agent Michael Harari and another Mossad agent who were both seen standing next to JFK Jr. Cessna. All four were at the airport just two days before the doomed plane took off with JFK Jr., his pregnant wife, and her sister. What's your thoughts on that? It just seems very suspicious, doesn't it, that they are there? Now, what also is suspicious is that who takes control of the investigation? James Baker. I mean, James Baker is, of course, the Bush family friend that ends up being appointed by the NTSB to head up the investigation. And he controls all the information in and out. He seals off the area for five days, 17 nautical miles as a favor to the Bush family. So uh, all this is very suspicious. One more thing we can think about too, the, the, the bodies were cremated too. So we have no remains. You look at the autopsy report for JFK Jr.'s body, you can see a number of unusual things, one of which is his midsection is, is separated from the other half. There's dotted lines in the midsection, like it was separated into two sections. It was blown to bits. So the autopsy shows parts of the body that were, that were separated, like in an explosion. So cremation, closed casket, strange things, all happening after the, the so-called accident for JFK Jr. The nightmare of his sister Caroline had to live through it through her dad, had to live through it through her uncle, and now had to live through it with her brother. Do you think because she was the only living Kennedy by that family tree that she was warned to keep quiet? Or do you think she just finally said enough is enough? I'm disappearing into the sunset. So nobody hears from me again. And my family is yeah, safe. I think, yeah, she internally just made the decision that she has no interest in running for politics. There was a brief consideration that she was, Governor Patterson was thinking of appointing her to fill uh, Secretary, or first lady, uh, Secretary, Senator, actually Senator Clinton's seat when she became Secretary of State, but um, you know she um, declined that. And Kirsten Gillibrand ended up getting the the uh, you know the nomination, but other than that, that's the only time she ever even thought about getting into politics. So yeah, she kind of I think maybe even just internally felt that it was just the best idea just to stay out of politics. Yeah, I mean, you just can't do too much like that. You have to you have to understand if if you're in that point of view. I mean, I think all of us, if we were in that point of view where two of our family members, including your close brother, are dead due to assassination, an uncle is dead due to an assassination, and your mother has died previously and you're the last one left, the last thing you're going to want to do is go cause a ruckus. You just want to live for your family at that point. Yeah. You have kids to take care of. At one point, you'd be the matriarch of the family. So it's just as important to, to survive, really, and just to stay under the radar, really, what we have to do. Yeah, exactly. And that's where I think the point is. You know, in regards to JFK Jr., in regards to this, do we know if he ever feared for his life? Or was he just too cocky and brazen to even realize that the CIA would try, or any government agency for that part, would try and take him out? I think that he felt that he had an obligation to look into this. He had hired two investigative reporters to look into this in his magazine. And he knew that this was what was necessary for him to just to do. 
and the consequences, I guess you could say. And there was a bit about him that was, um, I don't want to say uh, reckless, but arrogant maybe would be the better idea, confident in, in his own uh, self-esteem. You know, he certainly was uh, a confident person, and that might be playing into why he wanted to do this in the first place. No one's going to tell him what to do. Hypothetically, and I realize we'll never know the answer to this, but with all the information you have learned, let's say JFK Jr. gets into office, wins the governor seat, eventually makes a run for the White House and wins. In your mind, what does that do or change in the American political climate? I think it would change so many things. I mean, I think it would restore a sense of hope to our country. I mean, I think so many people were just traumatized by the JFK assassination, by Malcolm X, by Dr. King, Robert Kennedy, all those men who died that should have been alive still in the 1990s were cut down by assassins. He would have been there a new hope for our country, the United States. And a time of healing, I think, would have would have would have been possible for our nation. And there would have been a different approach to the war on terrorism, for example, more of an approach towards peace to the rest of the world, towards Muslim Americans, towards all kinds of things that could have been more of a, of a sense where you respect everyone, not just one party or the other, where there's less polarization person that could be beloved by all all Americans, president for all people. And I think that's why he's worth talking about still, because there are so little people like him anymore that everyone can kind of look at that's apolitical, I guess you could say. He's above politics. He always would just kind of shun politics and just treat everyone with respect. And I think that would have been what he brought to the presidency. Would eight years have been enough to change the entire flow, considering how damaged and corrupt the United States political climate has become? I think, yeah, if we play this out, he would have been in office, gets reelected in, you know, 2008, and there until 2013, and leaves office January 2013. So he has a long time there to to, to kind of rework the United States and bring the agency back to accountability, open up investigations into his uncle's assassination, to his, his father's assassination, and just to do things that were you know, just a different approach towards helping everyone. And I think that's what's lost when he was cut down on July 16, 1999. What has been the reaction around this book from people maybe in the know, out of the know, or just general reaction that you are making some pretty hefty claims here? Now, I've been on a number of different programs, and the reaction has been very positive. And people have been open-minded to this, because as I've been trying to do here, I just kind of lay out the facts, and you kind of reverse engineer this. And you look at the crime scene, Witnesses saw an explosion. He wasn't suffering from disorientation. He wasn't, he never made a distress call. The Navy lied about the rescue beacon. And he was a good pilot. There was no bad weather conditions. So if you look at the evidence of the case, I think my approach has met with a lot of, it has met with a lot of good reaction because I'm not just kind of blowing smoke here. I'm looking at the evidence of the case and given that, presentation, I think, with logic and evidence, people kind of have looked at it and said, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Do you think people want to know the truth? Do they want to know the truth about JFK? Do they want to know the truth about JFK Jr.? Because when you start getting into things like this, you know, even in the field of ufology, with everybody mm-hmm. talking about disclosure, I think there are certain topics that could really bring the entire stability of Washington, D.C. down. And I think the JFK assassination has that ability if it were to come out. You're right. And it's all pattern here. It's it's the kind of thing that could bring 
everything down because it, it's go, it goes through JFK. It goes through Dr. King. It goes through Robert Kennedy. It goes through JFK Jr. even goes through Teddy Kennedy. And I look at this in my book, too, that he, Teddy Kennedy also almost died in a plane crash. It was June 19th, 1964. And on that plane was him and another senator from Indiana that was enemy of the agency, too. And both of those men should have died. The plane crashed very mysteriously. Teddy Kennedy saw an explosion outside the aircraft. They just barely survived. So Deborah Quiddick also was unusual. Um, so we, we have all kinds of things happening with this, all these different people that, like you said, if you look at the, the truth here, it could bring the whole deck of cards down. So like you said, people don't want to look at this. It's just too upsetting. It's too, it's, it's, it's too much to handle really. Yeah. I, I can fully understand where you're going with that. Is the Kennedy des uh, the Kennedy situation dead. And I don't mean that to sound very, you know, as a bad pun or anything, but do you think that there will be more Kennedys coming up in the future who will have to face this same vitriol from groups like the CIA? Well, I guess it just depends on who wants to take a risk with, with uh, the next generation if they want to do public service, you know, what will be their call to service if they want to take part in this? Like you said, Carolyn Kennedy, she has no interest in this. So it's not going to be her. So you got to wonder who might take up the mantle. Uh, it looks like RFK Jr. He doesn't want to have any interest in running for politics either, but he has made the courageous step though, of admitting the truth about who killed his father with Sir Han, Sir Han, at the very least. So we got to give him a lot of credit for that. Well, you can't blame him for wanting to know. Do you Absolutely. Think this, do you think this nightmare of the Kennedys, though, still haunts the family, where the current generation will tell generations to come, you know, be very careful, be very diligent as to what you, you choose to do in life? Because, I mean, the minute you mention the last name Kennedy and that family, you immediately think politics. You think Ivy League schools. You think great education. Right. You know, you're not thinking about getting a part-time job at McDonald's growing up in school. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think that's why JFK Jr. wanted to run for office. He, he wasn't just good enough to be a magazine editor anymore. It wasn't impactful enough. And that had run its course. So he was, at that time in his life, he was, gonna, he was selling the magazine and using it for a platform for exposing the truth and running for office. So, and it seems like, like you said, there is this ingrained idea that you have to serve your country and do your best to um, walk in the legacy of the president's, J.K. Uh, Jr.'s father. Make sure you honor his legacy and continue on his, um, you know, his legacy of service to your country. Outside of the bushes. Was there anybody who was very outspoken about Junior? That wanted to, you know, see him dead? Would like to, would like to see him out of the way. Mm -hmm. Well, we can, I think, rule out the Clintons. I mean, that's been talked about a lot, that perhaps they wanted to get rid of him because he wanted to run for Senate in New York. But he made very clear that he not, did, want, did not want to run against Firstly, uh, Clinton. The families were and so are very close. And he was much more interested in governor of New York, which was a better stepping stone of the White House. So he told his family and friends that that's, he was not going to run for the Senate. He told her the same thing, too. So there, there was no motive there. And in fact, in the 1990s, when George Magazine was being published, there was not a single word printed that was in any way disrespectful to President Clinton. And of course, there are many scandals that came out in the 1990s that he could have used to talk about in the magazine. He, he never did. He always supported uh, you know, President Clinton. And in fact, Jack Kennedy was a big supporter of, of Clinton when he ran for president in 1992. So they were very close. You might know that JFK met 
Bill Clinton as a young man when he was 17 years old in the White House backyard in the Rose Garden. So there was no motive there. So it it seems like to rule them out, you're left with, if you conclude assassination, the motive does lie with the agency. We got about 90 seconds here before we got to take a break at the top of the hour. And, you know, going into the next half hour, I think there is still a couple of big questions we need to ask you in regards to this. But I'm going to start this off right off the bat. In Chapter 3 of your book, Exploding the Truth, the JFK Jr. Assassination, you say there might be an alleged Israeli motive. What do you mean by that? Well, in March of 1997, two and a half years before the JFK Jr. plane crash, George Magazine publishes an article about the Yitzhak Rabin assassination. And it talks about that there could be a conspiracy that, it, that killed the prime minister and lays out the evidence that it came from the government of, um, of Israel from their intelligence agencies. So was there a motive to kill J.K. Jr. because he, he, you know, he published his article, maybe? But it, it seems like kind of a tenuous link. I mean, why wait two and a half years to kill him after the article comes out? It seems kind of usual. And there's really no linkage to that other than just the article, which he didn't, he didn't even write the article anyway, just written by somebody else. So it's a tenuous link. It's worth mentioning, but, you know, it's been brought up by some people as a motive. You don't you don't sound like you really buy that one. No, I mean, if, if you wrote, he didn't write the article, first of all. And yeah. The article is kind of, it, it just kind of, it's not even specific enough to even say too many bad things about the government of Israel. It's just to mention a few different things here and there. And if you want to kill him, why wait two and a half years to do so? It seems strange. <laughs> it's a long time to wait to kill someone if you're mad, mad at them. For an article. <laughs> No kidding. No <laughs> kidding. John Corner, you hold on here, my friend. We're going to put you on hold. We got you for another 30 minutes on Spaced Out Radio. Hour number three with John Corner coming up right after this. out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott S-O-R. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. S-O-R archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily 
weekly and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. EscapeWatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social Media Freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. 
reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you for being with us. This weekend, while I am off finding my zen and my chi, I'm turning over the studio to Tessa Nicole Thomas with Spaced Out Weekend because we got you covered seven days a week. Tessa gets going at 9 o'clock Pacific, midnight Eastern at spacedoutradio.com. We welcome back everyone listening in on the SOR Radio Network, Deep Talk Radio, and Rev Radio. Don't forget, you can check out all of our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor and hit that subscribe button. Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Calipesian. Calipesian is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot. You can also, also, Shop at our brand new Spaced Out Radio store. It is damn cool. Go get your swag now. And, of course, read up on the SOR Newswire provided by Captain Shirk and so much more. For the final time tonight, we introduce John Corner. He has a couple of very controversial books that you can get on Amazon. His first one came out a couple of years ago called Why the CIA Killed JFK and Malcolm X, The Secret Drug Trade in Laos, and his newest book that I highly think you should read, Exploding the Truth, the JFK Jr. Assassination. John, thank you so much for being with us. We still have a ton of questions in regards to Jr.'s death here, so we're going to get right to it if you don't mind. In yes. regards to Jr., he had broken his leg mm-hmm. or fractured his ankle previous right. to making that fateful flight, and there's a lot of people who believe that may have had something to do with it. Take us through that injury. That's great. We should talk about this in some detail. So this was the week of uh, Memorial Day, uh, you know, May 30th, 1999, about, you know, a month and a half before the the assassination. And he has this accident where he's doing paragliding, parasailing, and he fractures his ankle. It doesn't break it, just fractures it. So he has almost, uh, he has all of June and, and, you know, 16 days into July to, for this to heal. So the day before the, you know, the assassination, this is a Thursday morning. He goes to the doctor, has the cast removed and the doctor looks at it, tests the ankle and it's completely healed. So he goes through Thursday, July 15th in New York city. He gets to work out in, he goes to the Yankees game, walks around New York, tests out the ankle. It's just feeling good. So we go to July 16th, Friday, another day, and the ankle's feeling fine. So if there was anything wrong with the ankle, he would have went back to the doctor, which he did not do. So the we get to the afternoon of, you know, taking off from Caulfield Airstrip, and just before he goes into the, you know, into the aircraft, he stops across the street to get a, uh, get a vitamin water and energy bar. And the guy there at the counter recognizes him and he asks him how's the ankle feeling and jk jr says it feels great feeling good so we know from those two days of testing the ankle we know from the witness that was at the convenience store that it was completely fine and we also know that he took off without without incident The, the pedals using for takeoff which required use of the ankle he had no problem with and we also know that as I mentioned before he called in at 9:39 p.m. one hour into the flight and say he was about to land the aircraft. So if anything was wrong with him or with you know the aircraft, he would have said something. And the idea that he crashed the ink because of his ankle just it's just not true. So when you look at the official investigation, where they're partially blaming that as part of the crash 
it's an easy escape route. You know what I'm saying? It's an easy oh, yeah. thing to blame that he lost control of it. Right. And just by looking at the basic facts, it doesn't make any sense. We also could say he knew how to use autopilot too. So he, he passed the instrument tests. So if he was in any kind of pain, you just switch that on. So all these different facts indicate there was nothing wrong with the ankle. And because we, we can just make this key fact mentioning that he calls in at 9.39 p.m., if he was in distress, he would have said something. He told air traffic control he's about to land, he's going to drop off Lauren Bissette, and that was the plan. And then one minute later, people on the ground see this explosion, and the aircraft is dropping on radar 14,000 feet per second. So something catastrophic happened there. And it was it was not because of his ankle. Could it have not been a fuel line that ruptured or something along those lines mechanically that caused the explosion? That's possible, too. Now, we could mention as well that we can rule that out because he checked the aircraft constantly. Every single thing he checked, every nut and bolt, every fuel line, every single thing on the aircraft he checked. It was a new aircraft, too. He just bought it a few months ago. So it was in perfect condition. He checked it all the time. So the idea of a defect seems, I think, kind of, uh, I think it would be not too likely, I guess you could say, because of the fact he checked everything. It was a brand new, air, brand new aircraft as well. Do you think, though, that this was expected? Was anybody in the family tipped off that this was going to happen? Was there worry that he was next on any sort of hit list? Well, the family certainly wasn't allowed into, which is unusual, in, into the uh, recovery area. So they were denied access to the bodies. So there's no chain of evidence here, which makes it very suspicious. Teddy Kennedy wanted to get in there and look for his, his nephew, but he was not allowed access because the, the agency goes in there, CIA goes in there, Navy goes in there. And again, the best evidence that we have that they're covering something up is because they lied to the American people. At 2.15 a.m., they put out this lie that one of their own aircraft is in the water there, this down Navy military aircraft. And it was not the Pepper Saratoga. So if that's the case, where is the dead pilot? Where's the where's the wreckage for that aircraft? How do you how do you cover that up? You can't. It'd be too much. It, it must therefore be the, the the Saratoga there in the water, and they need more time to make this look like an accident. That is the, such the key thing there to point to that they're covering something up. And I mentioned before, you can't confuse their rescue because one is like a foghorn, one is like a like a shrill sound. So. That fact alone shows the covering things up. No family allowed in, no media allowed in. Five days to recover the bodies in 100 feet of water run by James Baker. None of this makes any sense. So when you look at it and you and you start to form your opinion, what's the the biggest piece of evidence that you found out of everything that you have said that convinces you that you're trying to bring to the public here, John, about this death of Junior? I got to go back to the rescue beacon. I mean, it, it has to be that. I mean, it, if you look at logically here. The the Navy and the Coast Guard knew where he dropped off a radar. It's a specific point on the radar. It's 100, 100 feet of water. It's a small aircraft. It's three bodies. It doesn't take that long to find these things. It's not like you're in the middle of the ocean or something. You're in a small little area. And it took them five days. And they sealed off 17 nautical miles. They found luggage, sneakers, all kinds of things on the land indicated an explosion and then they tell us at 2 15 a.m that they had found first they say oh we did we didn't find the pepper saratoga said, oh no no it's a naval aircraft one of ours in the water and then all of a sudden the story just goes away where's the body for that pilot where is he did you notify the family where's the wreckage so if if you look at what's happening here 
it doesn't make any sense. There was no bad weather. He wasn't disoriented. He wasn't a bad pilot. His leg wasn't hurting him. So the official cover story here that they're putting out, if you just look at the facts, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. No, I understand that. But was there one person in particular Mm -hmm. that you talked to in your research that gave you that explosive evidence that makes you believe that there is a lot of truth to this? Right. And I think I mentioned this before. So there's two things here. Okay. You go back to the witnesses. There were three people that saw this explosion. They saw a flash of light and heard an explosion. And one was a, was a, he was a, he still is a lawyer in Pennsylvania. His name is Victor Pervanic. The other was a member of the Kennedy family. And the third one was a reporter for the Vineyard Gazette. And I tried to track down this reporter from the Vineyard Gazette. He had been interviewed on the air on ABC News talking about this on the day of the uh, day after the accident that he saw this explosion. And I tried to track down his name. And as I mentioned, I failed three times to find the microfilm, denied it. So I got the film from the Library of Congress and found his name. And after the, the book came out, I got contacted by a woman who lives at, in the vineyard. And she says, it's, people in the vineyard know about this. They know what happened. It was a beautiful night. There are many people on the, on the vineyard walking around. The wedding was that weekend. Many people were there that night. It was a beautiful, clear night. And they saw this, but they kept quiet about it. She saw it too. So there, there, people out there, they're, they're too scared to talk about this. And I'm hoping that this book will start people to realize that, that there's more to this needs to be talked about. That people can start being, start being scary about this. That they can be confident that there's, there's truth out there. Can just talk about it. Be, don't be afraid. Why are they fearful of talking? Were they warned much like people in Roswell during the UFO crash there? And they were warned that if they talked about it publicly, that their families would be affected. Were they, were these people warned by the CIA, the IRS, the NSA, the DOD? I I think that it's just strange that, that they must've been, I mean, let me just go through this again. Okay. I, I, this reporter for the Vineyard Gazette, there was this person, he talked on the air about seeing this explosion and other people had tried to contact the editor. What's the person's name? Who is this person? And the editor said for his own safety, we're not going to reveal what his name is. He is a, he's a, he was intern that summer. He, he was going to school locally and he was only there for a few months. So he wouldn't want to talk about who, what his name is for his own safety. Now, if you go into the microfilm, I thought, well, if there was a name there that is, that appears, you know, just in the summer and then disappears after the, you know, the late July or August, that must be the person. So I asked for microfilm from that newspaper three different times. I was denied to get the microfilm until I got it from the Library of Congress. And I finally got the name. So why was it denied? Why did those newspapers deny me the film? I think they're scared. People are scared about this. Maybe they should be. But you can only kill so many people. <laughs> That's very true, isn't it? Well, think of Nina Rhodes Hughes. Think of, think of Nina Rhodes Hughes. She, again, she is this person, Nina Rhodes Hughes, who was RFK's assistant in the campaign. And she saw a second gunman at the Ambassador Hotel ballroom that was shooting at, at RFK. And she told the FBI that she heard 12 to 14 shots, which was much more than Sirhan could possibly have shot in his gun. And she has kept quiet because she felt that she would be killed. So many people, they feel that way, that, that real or not, maybe there's, it's more in their minds, but there certainly is this, this fear that people don't want to talk about these things. So how many people do we know actually witnessed this alleged explosion? So 
So we've got Victor Perbanic, and he talked about this in a book called The Day John Died. So it's been documented there. He's a lawyer from uh, Pittsburgh. I contacted him too. I emailed him. I said, would you like to talk about this? And he said, yes, I would like to. Give me two weeks. I'm going to finish my court case. Get back to me then. So I, two weeks, I contacted him. I said, you ready to talk? Didn't hear back from him. Asked him again, nothing. So he was interviewed by John Anderson and the New York Post. So he's on record already. Then there was this other reporter I mentioned from the Gazette. I didn't give his name, but I do know his name from my own research. This intern at the Gazette from that summer. And the third witness was from the Kennedy family that saw the same thing. And this fourth person that came forward to me after I was on coast. So, and she said, according to her, that there is others out there that, as I said, they're keeping quiet about this. That doesn't sound like a lot considering an explosion at 14,000 feet. And I've been in that area of Martha's mm-hmm. Vineyard. Okay. And it's a, that, that entire area is gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, except for the great white sharks that scare the living daylights out of me. But that's another story altogether. But at 14,000 feet plus, any type of explosion is going to be seen by more than four people. Absolutely. So so that's why I think people, like you said, they're staying quiet about this because they're not willing to talk about this because they're scared. Well, I mean, we also have to look at the fact, too, and I may be surmising here, John, and correct me if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. that's a very affluent and wealthy area. You just don't, you know, go there and, and get a mortgage for $200,000. You know what no, I'm saying? It, it's an expensive <laughs> area. That's where the rich play. And when you have that area and that those expenses and those companies and reputations, those are people who are more worried about their reputation than speaking loudly in, in some sort of conspiracy. Absolutely. Yeah, they're not going to be talking about this. So how do you go about getting more people doing that? I think you got to just start, you know, slowly, just one at a time. As Like with the Kennedy assassination, it took several years. People just even talk about that where they got to the point where they could feel like they were, there were serious questions about what happened in, in, in Dallas. I mean, even just like with uh, Sirhan Sirhan. I mean, it, we can only really say just recently that we know what really happened there because the assassin came forward and admitted this, what, how he was brainwashed by the agency. So it, it takes, in some cases, decades. And we're going to get to next July... And we're going to hear the same thing. I guarantee it. The media is going to say that he was a reckless pilot, that there was disorientation, that the weather was bad, that his foot was hurting him. All that stuff is going to be said again next July, and it's and it's going to make me sick because it's not the truth. Mm-hmm. Do you see that truth ever coming out, much like people hold hope that JFK Sr., And the truth will come out about his assassination. I do have that hope. I mean, and I hope this book will help with that. I mean, people can just use it as a tool to to just show the world what really happened. I mean, that that these were, these were good men. They were trying to do things. They're they're trying to change the world in a way, in, in a positive way. In a, in a way that a hopeful way to, to to serve their country, and accident or not, it, it's just tragic because we have in both of these men, the rest of their lives would have been filled with things that could have helped our, the United States for for peace and service to our country, and I think that's that's kind of what what makes this this so tragic. Has anybody in the government or within the CIA? read your book and approached you and said, you're 50% of the way there, you're 80% of the way there. Where did you get all of these facts? Have you had that happen yet? I did. After the the first book came out and when it went on coast, uh, uh, this is, I got contacted privately 
by two pilots from Air America. And they had said, you know, yeah, this is what was going on in, in Southeast Asia. They were part of the pilots that were moving the drugs. And they regretted it because what was happening is because if you look at the consequences, they were moving drugs to their fellow American GIs in Vietnam that were they're addicted to heroin and it, many, many of them are killing themselves, committed suicide because of drug addictions. So the whole story here is just, it's just so tragic and so many different uh, tentacles that this goes into. What about Even for the, talk J- about what just, about, what, yeah. what about for the JFK ahead. Jr. story? Now this one, again, the book has just come out in October, so it's still a little bit fresh, but the contacts that I have been given like with I mentioned, just the witness that they were that, I, that contacted me. So as, up until now, nothing yet for that. But we'll see. But with the other one, I did get contacted. All right. I got one final question from our audience before we got to wrap this up because we only got about two minutes left with you here. And this right. question comes from Trip. He's saying, Mr. Corner, do you think there was any type of connection between the TWA Flight 800 and JFK Jr.? Interesting, because you have the same area we're talking about here. So we have the possibility here, I think, that when you have the area that you're you're talking about, if you want to take down an aircraft, it's better to do so over water. Because if it's over land, it's, it's much messier. Because then there's more witnesses, and the debris can go onto the land more. But if it's over water which both of them were, you can use a surface-to-air missile, and the assassins can easily get out of the area more quickly on perhaps a high-speed boat. So I think that the method of both of them is probably similar. Interesting. With one minute to go here, please let everybody know, John, where they can find your books, and if they have any information for you regarding eyewitness testimony or anything like that, how they can get a hold of you. All right, my website is, is my company name. is Again, it's paranormalwalks.com. So, again, paranormalwalks.com. And there are my email addresses on there. It's paranormalwalks at, at gmail.com. And, again, Amazon has the books. And, you know, you can contact me from the website, paranormalwalks.com. And Amazon's got the, the books there, too. Excellent. John Corner, it's been a while. But I'm so glad to get you back on Spaced Out Radio, my friend. It is an absolute pleasure. we got to do this again and not wait like almost four years. <laughs> right. That's true, David. It's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, my friend. Take care. Thank you so much for being on the show oh, tonight, John. You're welcome. Thank you so much, too, Dave. Have a good Anytime. day. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you. Coming up next on the Mighty SOR, we finish off our week with a little Olaf Phillips and the SOR Newswire coming on up. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio on the Deep Talk Radio Network. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. 
you'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the based out radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Did you know Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi there, this is Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm here to take you on a paranormal journey each Saturday and Sunday night. Why change the station when you have it all right here? Together, we'll hang out and share some strange and scary stories. And don't forget, we have Psychic Sundays as well, so come tune in Spaced Out Weekend. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com, where we own the night. Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. 
SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there. This is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Rounded third, we are heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio, and we bring in Olaf Phillips, the man, the myth, the team stump legend for the SOR Newswire. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire, which can be found on our website, spacedoutradio.com, by clicking on the news section. Captain Shirk takes care of it all, but each and every night at the back end of the show, we round things out with the weird, the wacky, the WTF, which is why we bring in Paranoia Magazine's Olaf Phillips. Mr. Olaf, how you doing? Greetings and salutations. What is going on, my friend? Are you all ready for the weekend? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I made Beautiful. bread today. I got a bread. little paranoid and I made bread. Yeah. I'm a little I'm a little made, jealous about that. I made white bread. That is awesome. I am a big a fan of the bread. I'm a big fan of You know what I like is uh bread and butter dipped in vinegar yeah. and pepper. That's good stuff. I never tried that. S- simple but good. Simple. You know what I lived in the you know, when I lived in England, um, there was a bakery down the street, and we used to dispatch somebody in the mornings, and they would go down and buy this English sandwich. And to call it a sandwich is probably a, a little too strong. It's more like a heart attack. And basically, it was a fresh bag, still warm, a French baguette that was small, and, and they would cut it, and then they would slather it in butter, and then they would shove bacon in it. Mm. Anything good. that includes <laughs> bacon, bacon is and butter, good. <laughs> bacon oh, and butter. Ma- yeah, yeah. You know what I miss, and my mother doesn't make them anymore. She she used to make homemade buns, and I remember like when she when she was making homemade buns, I would take it like a dozen of them that are still like warm, throw some butter in there, and just oh, hammer yeah. them. I mean. Goodness me, that was that would have been fantastic. I, I, you know, and my mom is one of these people, man, who never gives up the recipe. She always says, "Oh, well, you can. I'll oh. give it to you. I'll give it to you," and then you never get it. You know what I'm saying? Oh no, I give, should, I give up the recipe. It, I don't care. Yeah, my, my mom doesn't. My mom doesn't. She is one of those. Well, you know, I've been under a lot of pressure from various people to make a cookbook, a paranoia cookbook. So I've I've thought about it. (laughs) I just haven't gotten there yet. Too busy with cryptid movies. Yeah, no kidding. Let's get to the news, my friend. Okay, I've got probably the most important question of the night for you. Are you ready? Do you like mac and cheese? No. You don't. I am one of the minority of Canadians who does not like mac and cheese. Grosses me out. Well, then this this story is going to absolutely horrify you. Are you ready? I guess so. You got Costco. You got Costco up there in the bleak north, right? Yes. Costco now sells a 27-pound tub 
of macaroni and cheese that lasts for 20 years. Do you like mac and cheese? No. Do you love mac and cheese? The membership warehouse store Costco now sells 27 pounds of it in a big six-gallon oh, mop bucket. For eighty nine ninety nine, you get 180 servings of Chef's Banquet mac and cheese, which the company says will remain edible for up to 20 years. That means that you could still be enjoying this macaroni and cheese during President Ocasio Cortez's second term. So does this does this actually mean is is this the same type of mac and cheese that Jim Baker's trying to pawn off? Probably. Oh man. Yeah. This is <clears throat> it's a big tub. <clears throat> I can't attest to the taste of it, but it's a huge tub of mac and cheese. I hear you there. Oh, that just sounds disgusting, seen, man. Have you seen the the remixes? There's a guy that does these Remixes a, a, of uh, Jim Baker, his show with the new wife. Oh yeah! Sometimes I, I go on YouTube, YouTube just just to watch, you know how how horrible he is. What a terrible human being! Anybody who falls for that needs a shaking. <laughs> I don't grab know, him by the funny. just grab him by the shoulders and start shaking. Yeah, and if you noticed. Every episode, he's been told by God the end is right around the corner. We are in end times. You bu- you better buy my sure. buckets of food for one hundred and forty nine ninety nine, and you need a lot of them oh. because you don't know how long you're going to be underground, living in the sewers, without clean Until the water. The rapture takes place, and you descend into the sky and vanish. Exactly. Oh, uh, what a, what a sickening hypocrite! Makes me ill. Hate people like that. Well, let's let's remember what happened to the PTL club. You know, let's remember where he comes from. True that. The sad Long part is he I, still ha- he still has Bakerland or whatever the hell it's called. But nonetheless, let's get oh, to really? the next story, man. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Go on YouTube. It's right there. There's there's a show you there's a movie you should watch. I'll tell you about it later. Florida man chews a police car seat after cocaine arrest. Nice. Home said Florida, a Florida man was arrested Thursday night after more than 40 grams of cocaine were found in his possession during a traffic stop near the Florida Keys. Not before, uh, but not before he decided to eat part of the arresting officer's patrol car seat. According to Monroe County Sheriff's Office, Melvin Stubbs, 37, of Homestead, was charged with cocaine trafficking and resisting arrest. He also he was also charged with property damage for chewing and or eating a sheriff's patrol car seat after he was taken into custody. How much cocaine do you have had to have snorted to start chewing up police seats? Because those are hard leather, man. You got to be really oh. whacked out to be doing that. You know, here, um, a few times with Cub Scouts and whatever, <clears throat> I've seen the police cars, and they they actually use like uh, plastic. They have like that you can like hose down here, so we don't have police car. Our police cars don't have seats you can eat. At least most of them don't. I wonder what oh, they taste but, like. But either way, either way, how sharp are his teeth to be able to gnaw through that? That's not easy. All excellent questions, Dave. Answers that I do not have because I'm not oh. in Florida. Oh, well, well, you know what? This is just another beautiful check mark beside the lovely state of Florida's name. Well, you demand this from me. It's part of the contract. Hey, I know. Man. I love my Florida stories. I still want to go down there fishing. I still want to visit Disney World. It's a trip, Disney World. It's a trip. Yeah. yeah. You know what my dream is, actually, to go down there? I know we bug Florida a lot. My dream is actually to go down there and fish for snakeheads. I want to do that. Go fish, because there's an unlimited cull on them. And then you bonk them on the head, you throw them back in the water, and watch the alligators eat them. That's what I want to do. I want to feed alligators. in, In my humble opinion, do you know what the best Disney park is? France? No. 
Although, although Disney Paris is not bad. No, it's Disney Sea. It's a nautical theme. Is that the, cru- uh, park is that the cruise in, ship? In, no, it's a nautical themed Disney park in Tokyo. Oh wow! It is by far the best. The best. Yeah, they have like a like a 1950s era, uh, like Captain Nemo Island in the center of it with a full size Nautilus. It's it's the trippiest. It's so awesome. And the food. Oh, oh man, the food. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Sushi. Best thing. Sushi best Disney. thing about best thing about Disneyland that I ever did was we took our kids to Goofy's kitchen. Kitchen costs a lot of money, but all the characters come up and oh, eat yeah. dinner with you. Fantastic it's move. It's a trip. fantastic move. Yeah, stay stay in the Grand Californian. It's a it's a pretty trippy hotel. Yeah. Okay. Let's Next. go. Self driving Tesla collides with autonomous robot in Las Vegas. Of course. A Russian did. robotics company said one of its autonomous pro- promo bots was taken out by a self-driving Tesla on the eve of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. The promo bot, sh- shared a vi- a promo bot shared a video recorded outside the Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino showing one of its namesake machines at the side of, the, of a driveway at the facility. Multiple cars easily passed by the autonomous robot, but a self-driving Tesla Model S collides with the robot, and drives away. The Promobot, which has knocked off its wheels, was destroyed, the company said. The collision took place a half mile from CES, the technology trade show that began on Tuesday. I guess that Tesla didn't want any competition. No kidding. Get rid of them. Get rid of that damn robot. I'm telling you, man, what if the robot actually sensed the other robot and said, I'm taking this jerk out? That AI technology, man. That AI technology, man. I'm not a fan of it. Not 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 a fan of it. It scares me. Yes. You give them too much control, it's lights out, baby. It's murder. It's murder. Faster. Now, Catherine in the chat room says, That was a setup. The Tesla barely touched it, and it gently tipped over. Doesn't matter. It's a setup. It was murder. That Tesla murdered that promo bot. Exactly. We got time for one to maybe two more. Well, I got one more, so we're in good shape. Perfect. We're going to make it a good one then. Blindfolded Utah teen crashes car doing the bird box challenge. A blindfolded teenage driver in Utah crashed into another car for obvious reasons on Monday, according to the Layton Police Department. Bird box challenge while driving, predictable result. The police tweeted on on Friday, along with a photo of the two mangled cars on the Layton Parkway, surrounded by snow-covered sidewalks. One truck appears to have its passenger side bumper bent upward, uh, while the entire driver's side of the Honda HRV is smashed. The, air, the side airbags of the HRV appear to have been deployed. Luckily, no injuries, the police wrote. Layton police, Layton police spokesman, Lieutenant Travis Lehman, told CBS News that a 17-year-old girl was driving with a 16-year-old passenger at the time of the crash. The Bird Box Challenge, which has gone viral on social media, is inspired by the Netflix movie Bird Box, starring Sandra Bullock. In the movie, characters have to move about outside the outside world wearing blindfolds to avoid looking at an unseen monster that forces them to kill themselves. In the viral challenge, participants attempt to do ordinary things while blindfolded, which again, is dangerous for obvious reasons. Earlier this Mm. month, Netflix warned its viewers against the Bird Box Challenge. Can't believe I have to say this, but please do not hurt yourselves with the Bird Box Challenge, the company tweeted on January 2nd. Dumb. How stupid do people have to be? (laughs) Honestly. How stupid do people? I mean, yeah. I mean to to, you know, to drive yeah. to drive blindfolded. Who thinks that there's something <laughs> smart about that? Honestly, who thinks there's something obviously, smart about that? Obviously, a 17 year old Utah teen thought it was a great idea. Well, I got one for you, my friend. You're gonna no, like this. No, so. Let's do it. Uh huh. All right. This one is a couple days old. Actually, it came out yesterday, late yesterday. Did you hear about Evelande Jean-Pierre? No. 
Okay. 29-year-old Evelande Jean-Pierre was hungry. So she broke into a Florida police substation, walked into the cafeteria, ate an officer's chicken dinner, and then took off. Now, this isn't okay. just the end of this. She broke into the police station to eat. She was there for about 45 minutes, left her wallet behind containing her two ID cards. All right. But she didn't go through the door. She actually <laughs> broke a window and then shoved the chicken dinner in the microwave and then walked out. Okay. Who does this? Okay. Who breaks into a police station to eat an officer's lunch? Why is this happening in Florida? Why? I, you know, I, I think there's some sort of a dimensional rift in Florida. It's I mean, definitely. Just, I've looked. You just don't see this kind of stuff in, like, Wisconsin. Yeah. The officers arriving in the mo- for the morning shift found the broken window into the cafeteria and a hastily eaten chicken dinner scattered in the kitchen. At what point does Evelande think in her brain that this is a good idea? She's charged with burglary. Um, Court records do not show if she has an attorney or not. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We've got to go to the thought of the day um, after that one. I've- I, I'm, I'm speechless. You should be. You should be speechless. It's ridiculous. Who does she'll this? She'll break into Costco. She can break into Costco and have mac and cheese. Oh. Really Thought good. of the I day Dave, happens Costco. every night at this time, man, where we really put a good. question on our Facebook and Twitter pages and then read your responses on the air. Today's Thought of the Dave is as follows. Does it even matter if the JFK conspiracy is ever fully revealed? Your thoughts. William states, No, people are going to believe what they want to believe regardless of any evidence brought to light. Trixie, I do not believe it would carry any impact whatsoever because it happened almost 60 years ago. And I lost my page just like that. Son of a gun. Hit that button. Hit the wrong button. No, no. I think it would matter. Oh, I do, too. I do, too. But All right. So it goes. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll read tricks you get. I I do not believe it would carry any impact whatsoever because it happened almost 60 years ago, and that's ancient history. People will not care. Our country has been banded together for 222 years, and 60 means that's one-fourth our history. Old news. Russ, it has been. That's all he put. Amy, yes, because I want to know how much our government lied to us about that and all the other crap they lie to us about. Matt, doesn't matter because we all know the CIA did it. Kennedy would have ended the Cold War by the middle of his second term, putting people like George H.W. Bush out of power. Robert. Well, I'm sure only what they w- they wanted would be revealed. Oswell lives in Soviet Union and then visits Soviet embassy in Mexico shortly before assassination. Hmm, then he is killed? Kelly, not really. If the entire truth was put out, would anyone who had any contradictory theories believe it? What I see these days, I highly doubt it. People don't want the truth, even if it goes against their beliefs. Sleepy Dave, yes, it matters, but the truth will not come out. National security reasons, I am sure. Duck, Jim Mallard from the Mallard Report. Not too much went away in a fire. He's always so deep. James, pretty sure it it has been revealed for years, just not by the Corporate Overloads Media Propaganda Delivery System programmed. I don't think he likes the media. Reverend Keith, yes, it must be fully revealed. If the U.S. powers that be do not start addressing the desires of the people, the people will take the option out of their hands. Historically, this has a body count and everyone loses. Carl, 
Sadly, it won't matter a damn bit. The first post by William Pullen said it perfectly. This is just the way we are. Always have been. Marianne, I always thought the mafia did it to revenge Marilyn Monroe's Kennedy or killing by the Kennedys. And then Barry Taff. We're going to try and get him on the show. Yes, it does. Man, man a few words. Captain Shirk. I think the people need to understand the absence of closure. Without it, a huge sorrow lives inside of you forever. The mind wishes for answers, for reconciliation, and for anything that would make sense. Until then, it is a continual sadness. I experienced it all as it happened, and I would love to know the truth. Final word of the night goes to Mr. Joe Allgaier. JFK shot Oswald first. I think. And I blew that line. JFK shot at Oswald first. There we go. Where can people find Paranoia Magazine, Olaf? ParanoiaMagazine.com, Paranoia Magazine on Facebook. Uh, Check out Conspiracy 101, and uh, hopefully we'll be doing another podcast uh, on Sunday. Perfect. And you can find the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com, clicking on our news tab. Captain Shirk has it all looking good. Thanks to John Corner for coming on the show tonight, talking JFK and JFK Jr. Tomorrow night and Sunday, Tessa Nicole Thomas is in for Spaced Out Weekend. Catch it all at 9 o'clock Pacific, 12 o'clock a.m. Eastern at spacedoutradio.com. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking us out with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Big thank you to all of you taking part in the chat rooms, listening in on the shows, all of our new listeners we gained this week, and everybody on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Thanks for making it a fun week, because together, my friends... We own the night. I will talk to you in 21 hours from now. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Good night.